We are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Frank Van Diggelen with us. Uh, please know that uh, Frank is a he the head of the location group for Google Android. So we'll hear about that today. Let me tell you a little bit about his background, which goes back a while, ways for navigation. Uh, at age 19, he became a navigation officer in the South African Navy uh, before going to college. So he's been at this for a while. In between the South African Navy and Google, he worked at Navsys with Allison Brown, Aztec, Magellan, Global Locate, and then Broadcom. And so he's a superb system engineer. He's also a great educator. He has written the textbook AGPS, Assisted GPS, GNSS, and SBAS, which is the leading textbook for AGPS. It's, it's a wonderful book, so have a look at it if, if you have a chance. Uh, the other thing uh, in terms of teaching uh, is I enjoyed very much being his co-teacher for a MOOC, a massive open online course on GPS. And I think we had uh, some 30,000 people at least express interest in it from 190 countries or so. And remarkably, 3,000 of them even finished the course. So we thought uh, that was pretty good. Please join me in welcoming Frank. Well, thank you, Per. And uh, thanks uh, to Tom and Brad and the people who put this on. Uh, this, this is my favorite symposium of the year by far, and I'm sure you can all see why. There's just uh, some great speakers here, and I hope I can uh, hold up my end of the day. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you about location. Uh, in Android, um, because that's, that's what I do now, and since I joined Google, I've been fascinated to see just how location is in all aspects of what goes on in a phone. We sometimes think, Brad talked about it, that, that uh, phones have kind of taken over GPS. Most GPS receivers by far are found in phones, but if you go look inside the phone, you, you realize that location has taken over the phone, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So you've all heard of Journey from the center of the earth. This is, think about this as journey, sorry, journey to the center of the earth. This is journey from the center of your phone. We'll like go down into the phone and, and bubble our way up and look at all the location things uh, that we can find on the way out. And, and all the way through everything we do at Google, there's machine learning and AI. And uh, I'm going to point out just a couple of examples of that to give you a, a flavor for it as we go through. So look out for that. So, uh, this, this is uh, what Android is. Android is a software stack that allows you to make phones. If you want to go out and make phones, this is how you can do it. And as a result, there are one and a half billion phones in use now. And they've all got GNSS in them, all using this stack. So there are one and a half billion Android phones in use around the world. Uh, they all organized like this, and right at the bottom, right deep in the heart of the phone, are the chips. And let's start there with GNSS. Uh, so one of the exciting things that happened in the past few months is that uh, we made GNSS raw measurements available from the phone for the first time ever. So for the first time ever, you can get at the raw measurements uh, from your phone uh, and build apps on this. And this is what the API looks like. And you can see there's things there like satellite ID, SNR, CN0, and even things like carrier phase. So you can get this information out. Uh, and we ran a tutorial on this at the recent ION uh, conference in uh, Portland. And uh, right away had some interesting results. One of the attendees at the tutorial took the data that we'd provided from a Samsung Galaxy S7 and did this with it, and this is going to be uh, in GPS World magazine this month. Uh, this is carrier phase from a cell phone, and that's showing you position. And you see the scale goes from minus one to one meters. And uh, I contributed to this by holding the phone and putting it down on a surface and then picking it up. So, and you can actually see that in the, in the, in the position. And in the middle, that phone is stationary, and the precision of the location there is a few centimeters. So that's interesting. Uh, and then the, the way we get this information out is uh, we've got anyone can build apps. It's, uh, 
and you can and you can exercise that APK and get the data out for your own app. We've provided an app called GNSS Logger, uh, which you which you can get uh, from Google, and then it looks like that on the right, and you can choose to get location measurements, nav messages, and so on. And so let's just look at what happens when you get some measurements. Well, what do you do with them? Well, the first thing you can do is plot them in MATLAB, and we've made some open source tools available for you so you can do that. So top left, you could get pseudo ranges versus time. So as you can see, this is GPS measurements. They're about 20,000 kilometer pseudo ranges, as you'd expect, but it's not that interesting over a course of a minute. So the next thing you could do is subtract off the initial value, and then you can see some of these satellites are getting closer to you, so they're rising. Some are getting further, they're setting. And then you can take the uh, single difference over time and divide by the difference in time. So now you've got the delta pseudo range, and that's what's plotted over there. And what you can also do is get the pseudo range rate, or aka Doppler with a different sign. And that's shown there the, when, you, when you run that app, it'll create a comma separated variable file. And so that's actually the output from the device. And so, for example, you can see the numbers plotted there. So satellite 19 has a pseudo range rate of 288 meters per second. And that's that gray line underneath the red line. So the, it's not the median of the red line. It's a separate measurement. It's the Doppler measurement. Uh, and then, for example, 24 is minus 198 here. And now having done that, so you can do that, just start plotting the data. And then right away, you can do some decent analysis of what's going on in your phone. For example, just, just by looking. You look at that, and what jumps out at you? Third, look at satellites 13, 15, and 2. Look at their pseudo ranges. They're jumping around by about 100 meters here. That's what raw pseudo ranges do. But why these three? What's, what's wrong with these three satellites? Any? Multipath? What? Low on the horizon. Low on the horizon, maybe. See, that one's got the lowest range rate. That one's got the highest. If we look at the azimuth elevation, look at the bottom left, 13, 15, and 2. So they're low on the horizon. If you go further and look at where I was when I collected this data, some of you will recognize that. That's Stanford campus, uh, Bill Hewlett and the Packard buildings. And we're looking south in this picture. And so if you squint and truly believe, you can see the satellites, 2 and 13. So not only are they low, but they're partly blocked by the building. So, we, so we're picking up multipath, we're picking up blockage through the trees and some kind of refraction maybe around the building. So if you're the first kind of person who wanted to study the environment, including the buildings, right away you see that these are the satellites for you. If you were the person making the cell phone and, the, and this happened to the high satellites, which weren't blocked, that tells you something about your, your system. And that's sort of the point of having these these measurements come out. They tell you something about the system that you can never tell uh, at, at the board level because the system changes as you, as you build it. So, so just with that very simple analysis, you see that you can see interesting things that you could never see from position alone. Uh, and then I'll take it a little bit further. Uh, if you do a weighted least squares, that's WLS, uh, weighted least squares solution from, from the pseudo ranges at the top or the Dopplers at the bottom, you get three dimensions of position and then the common bias, aka clock offset. And so right now, you can, so just from there, you can see the behavior of the clock inside this receiver. So it goes from zero offset, just we, we initialize it as zero, and it goes to 100 microseconds in elapsed time of 200. So 100 microseconds over 200 is 500 parts per billion, or 0.5 ppm. And if you look at, you can get the same information from Doppler, and so you can see how the clock is behaving. That's typical of a TCXO. And so using the data that comes from the phone itself, you can see how the clock is behaving in the phone. And not only can you see that, but it's the very best way of doing it. It's, this is a better way of measuring how the clock's behaving than getting a frequency synthesizer and putting it in, and then you've got to mess with the system anyway, and you're not testing the end system. So this gives you a way to build better phones if that's what you do. And at Android, we've, we care very much about that because Google does make phones, but doesn't, we don't only make phones. We make the system available to all the other people making phones. So it's, very we, it's of great interest to us that they all have the best tools available to test what they make. And so that's one of the primary motivations for doing this. Uh, you can also get uh, nav data, nav message. So I, I'm just showing you uh, the description to, show, to point out that there's GPS, Beidou, GLONASS, Galileo all supported, and this is what it looks like in that little app that I talked about. You can actually see the satellite data coming in. So this example is uh, PRN2, it's a GPS satellite, and there's the data. So this is the broadcast nav data, 
And you see the same data here. It's, it's bytes expressed in signed decimal format. So you would interpret that. If you're smart, you can figure out what 63 is in binary. I like to go with that binary number two. I know what that is in binary. And so on. So that's all the broadcast data. And then you can see the different satellites. Here's GPS, here's GPS, here's GLONASS. They've got a different nav message. You can see it's shorter there. So all that information's there. So you could, if you wanted to, you could build a, a reference station or a monitor station from a phone and, and, and check the bits coming from the satellite. Or if, as I said before, if you're building the phone itself, you can check your bit error rate directly just, just from this for all the systems that you're tracking. Uh, and so that, I, I, there's a lot more to show you than just GPS, but I wanted to give you a flavor of these raw measurements because it's the most exciting thing so far. And so in summary, what, what good are they? Well, I, I did want to start with scientific and pedagogical use. So pedagogical, fancy word for teaching, is the very first use we made of these was in the class that Pear and I teach at Stanford, AA272C, Introduction to GPS. The beginning of this year, the students took these raw measurements and the ephemeris data, and with nothing else, they computed their position on Earth, which was quite exciting for them and for us, that they could do that. And for the teachers in the room, you can do that with your students, with the tools uh, available from us. Uh, and then with any uh, phone, with any phone that supports the Android N operating system, uh, I should mention. So the N or Nougat, they were named after sweets. Uh, and uh, if you, the, the, uh, you should, at the moment, it's in a few phones, not all the phones. So if you want to know which phones, let me know, and I'll point you to a website that'll, that keeps a, uh, uh, a spreadsheet to keep you up to date of which phones this is available in. Uh, but over the course of the next year or two, it'll be in all new Android phones. So that's the first use. You get some scientific uh, and teaching use out of it. You could get improved PNT, maybe. And when I say that, I, I don't mean necessarily, or I actually don't believe you can really improve on what the GPS vendors themselves are doing because they really understand their own chips, but we can do things like DGNSS or PPP, maybe even RTK, based on what I, I just showed you from the very first person who took this data and tried to do something with it, uh, and that, which will be in the GPS World uh, magazine this, this month. And then improved phones for system testing using uh, the data as I've explained. And then finally, we had a lot of interest recently in can people get access to the AGC, that's the automatic gain control measure. And this, this is a fairly new thing that is not supported right now in the raw data, but only because nobody had asked, not because we're trying to keep that information. In fact, the opposite. We want to make all the information available and people can do with it what they want. That's, the, that's, the, that's how Android is built. And so we're busy uh, just working with the GPS vendors to have some way, it's, it's, it's actually trickier than it sounds, to somehow standardize on how you communicate the AGC information. And then the interesting thing with that is if you see CN0 go down, usually it's because you walked indoors. But if you see CN0 go down and the AGC makes a large adjustment at the same time, maybe it's because you're jammed. And if a lot of phones get jammed at the same time, well then you just go to the centroid and find the jammer. So that's the idea. So that, that should be supported uh, in the future. And we're looking at that. Okay, so that's, that's all I'm gonna talk about on, in terms of the, uh, the GNSS raw measurements. And so the next thing down in the middle of the phone are the sensor chips. And there's a lot of them, as you know. By the way, the, the very first navigation chip, if you like. The very first chip ever in a phone that is used for navigation was the accelerometer. And they, they were put in the very first phone, so, so the phone knew the difference between when you had it on the table when you were holding it, so it could extend battery life. So accelerometers are very small, cheap chips, but they deserve some respect. And so it's accelerometers, gyros, and so on. And they've been around a while, and so uh, using the same paradigm, that, that data was made available a long time ago, so you can see things like gyroscope, heartbeat, light sensor, accelerometer there, magnetic field. So all these fields come up and that's been around for several years and so many apps have popped up that allow you to, to log this data or view the data and then you can do things with it. And one of the things that we do with it is activity recognition. And so this is one of the places where I can freely tell you a little bit about where machine learning is used, even though it's used throughout this, everything I'm telling you, I'm just gonna bring it I'm gonna bring it to the surface here and there. And activity recognition is one such example. So here's a snippet of a few seconds of data, and that's the accelerometer data in XYZ. And your phone wants to know what you're doing so you can get credit for the calories, because we all wanna know how far we walked and, and so on. If you're carrying a phone, it should know all that stuff. 
if you're trying to keep track of it. So, so this person is doing something. What do you think? Walking, maybe. They're kind of walking. It's this. This is a few seconds of biking. And the, the algorithms built into Android can, can tell you that. And so uh, and that, that's surfaced through something called Google Fit and many other apps too. You can, you, there's an API so anybody can make use of this. So the apps like Strava and so on can make use of the activity recognition APIs that run. So we create the algorithm but make the results available to anybody. Uh, and then this is the kind of data that you get. So you can query the activity and we can tell the difference between walking, running, biking, climbing stairs, even push-ups, sit-ups, and so on. I won't demonstrate, but if you do sit-ups uh, and you're wearing a, an Android watch, it can tell that you're doing sit-ups and count them for you. And if you do press-ups, it can tell the difference between sit-ups and press-ups and, and count those for you. Uh, and then things such as uh, whether you're in a vehicle or leaving the vehicle, so, and, and clearly you can, you can imagine how that works. It can tell the difference between that you're driving and then when you get out and walk. And that's a very useful one because it always remembers where you parked your car, which is kind of useful. Uh, and, uh, and then gestures as well. So when I said I wanted that we're covering all of location in the phone, I don't just mean location on Earth. There's, all kind, there's, there's velocity, which is literally a derivative of location, and gesture recognition is a kind of location. And so, so things such as double twist, which, so what, what is that for? Well, that's for the most important reason, as you all know, for having a cell phone in the first place, is selfies, right? So I want to take a selfie here and record this, you know, I'm very honored to be up here, right? So I switch on my phone and I was pointing at the screen. So what I do, the natural thing is, well, just twist and it knows I want that direction and smile. And there we go. So, so that's a kind of location that, that gets used. Uh, so let me talk a little bit more about the fitness and how this works and I can tell you more about uh, some of the machine learning. So how does, the, how does the phone know the difference between all of these things? How did it know that that short amount of data, and it's always got to be a short amount of data, by the way, because you only want to do these on little snippets of data. You don't want the phone working the whole time, else your battery won't last. So you take that short amount of data. How does it know the difference between biking and walking and running? Well, it does it through machine learning, uh, and this is how it goes. You collect a lot of data sets initially, and you classify the data. And once you've come up with classifications that allow the code to, to distinguish one from another, then you can move it into production. And, and I'll just give you a brief little flavor of how this works. So this is one feature of an accelerometer, and, it, and you can see it on the side there, it's the standard deviation of the magnitude of acceleration. And now there are dozens of features that you can get from an accelerometer. You can get the, the actual acceleration in each axis. You could get the standard deviation in each axis. You could get the harmonics, you could, do, you could do FFTs of each axis and look at the first, second, third harmonics. You can look at cross products and all kinds of things like that that may be related to the activity that you're doing, right? And you can kind of imagine that, that how certain activities like table tennis would have a certain periodicity that's different from tennis and so on. And so these, every X there is an activity that somebody was doing. And the horizontal axis shows you the speed and this vertical axis shows you one particular feature that's extracted. And so so what? What do you do with that? Well, if you start labeling them, and people label them, they, they could say, okay, I was running, and so people label the activities, and then you start to see some structure. So all the red is walking or running, and then these other colors are different things. Let's just focus on that for a moment, and that mess of before should suddenly start to make sense to you. You go, oh, I see. Right, walking or running is fairly slow, but a fairly high standard deviation of acceleration. Right? So that's a characteristic of walking or running, and there's something like dozens of other features that have a certain characteristic. And what are they? The beauty of machine learning is we don't have to figure that out ourselves. You get hundreds of thousands of labeled data sets and, the, and from the labels, the machine figures out which things are repeatable and are characteristic of that activity. And so you can imagine a vector of these, that, that one element of the vector is if you've got high standard deviation of acceleration and low speed and something else and something else and something else and something else and something else, there's a 98% chance you're walking or running and that will show up as the label. And that's how this, this works. Okay. And you can label all of these things. Okay, so now let's move to indoor location. And I'm going to start off with talking about Wi-Fi because if you get a location on your phone indoors today, and you're not right by the window or underneath some open skylight where GPS is going to come through, then 
almost certainly you're using Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is the, the, the dominant uh, technology for indoor location. And so, for example, if you look at your phone now, you'll get something like that. I did that about an hour ago uh, in a break, for sure, not while anyone was talking. Uh, and, and this is characteristic of what you see. Uh, we are right underneath those. We're here. Whoops. And it's off by a few tens of meters, and so we're, you know, we're really inside that bubble. And so what's going on? What happened there? Well, this is, what ha this is sort of the state of the art in terms of what you're carrying in your pockets today, is we use RSSI, or Received Signal Strength Indicator. And, and it's really nothing more than saying, well, if, you're, if the signal's strong, you're probably close to that access point, <coughs> right? Now, it gets laundered through a transmission model, and we come up with ranges, and you can pretend that it's trilateration, but it's really not. It's really a very simple approach uh, where you're just associating a strong signal with being close to an access point and a weak signal with being far. And you can see the problem right away, that if, you have, if the access point is here and I turn around, the signal suddenly gets weak. And so the algorithm would think that I moved far away. So signal strength as a means for figuring out where you are is fairly coarse, and the accuracy reflects that. It's of order of 30 to 50 meters, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. You can see which building you're in, but not exactly where you are. But help is at hand, and Brad, you mentioned it, that there's an IEEE standard, and it's 802.11mc, and it's round-trip timing. And then now, this is something where you can actually measure the time of flight and do location indoors the way God intended because that's why the speed of light is a constant. So we can navigate, right? And the way it works is the access point will advertise if it's RTT capable, and then you can, if it is, you can make a request, it sends you a signal, your device just turns that signal around and sends it back. And so now you have a round trip. The time of flight is gonna be nanoseconds, right? Because light travels one foot in a nanosecond, that's why we have feet. And, and that's a few nanoseconds, and it's, but it's going to be microseconds for the turnaround time because the software has got to do its thing. So it's thousands, this is actually thousands of time longer than the time of flight. So the magic comes in with a simple thing that the, the device that supports RTT and according to this standard will send you the time tags T1 and T4. And then what do you do? You do something so nice and simple. You just say T4 minus T1 is the total round trip time, right? T subtract. T3 minus T2, which you know, because you, you made those time tags at your end, which is the, the turnaround time. And that's twice the flight time, so times the speed of light is twice the distance, and you're done. And this works to meter level accuracy, and my colleague, Steve Malkos, who was also my colleague at, at Broadcom a few years ago, did a demo uh, at I ION conference a few years ago. We had a laser rangefinder and a cell phone, and they work the same. You can point, you can point the laser rangefinder at an access point and it'll measure 22.3 meters and the cell phone's measuring the same number to within a meter using round trip timing. So, so help is at hand for indoor location in terms of the underlying technology. And this is a standard that is supported by most 802.11 AC chips. So the hardware of 802.11 AC, uh, I can't say all because I don't know about all of them, but, but certainly most chips uh, that are 802.11ac compatible, which is all the Wi-Fi that you buy now, uh, they, they support this standard. It's just a question of finalizing the firmware, and the standard's at like 90% of the way through being published, and then we, we have that capability, we the community, uh, to do much better indoor location. So that's a good thing to look forward to uh, soon. And then one of the things that we've done with that uh, at Google is make the location available the, the, any location that we compute inside the phone, whether it's from Wi-Fi or whatever, is also available to emergency location services. And one of the places, so this is like E911, like E911, actually like the, uh, the new, the indoor E911 mandate, but without the mandate. This is just done uh, because some people at Google thought this would be a good thing to do. And it's been rolled out, for example, across the entire UK. So every UK carrier uh, is now making use of these APIs so that if anyone places an emergency call in the UK on an Android phone, whatever location is available to that phone at the moment will be provided to the emergency services. So instead of getting a cell ID where the diameter of where you might be is seven kilometers, you'll, you'll get the Wi-Fi location or whatever the phone has and it'll get you down to the building. So that's clearly a nice use case uh, of indoor location for what we've got today. So now I'm gonna get, uh, 
So, so tell, tell you a little, some, some abstractions of location and then look a little bit to the future. So, so as you go higher up in the stack, things get a little bit more abstract. So uh, I'm going to talk about two things now, FLP and geofencing. FLP stands for Fused Location Provider, and this is just our terminology for how all the sensors get integrated with the GPS. Uh, and you all know how, the, how this works, uh, and people have talked about it. I won't give you the details just to show you the, the difference. But the green is GPS alone in San Francisco, so that's uh, Market Street. And, you know, as you know, you get big reflections uh, of the buildings. And the blue is when you integrate with the sensors available on the phones. So I, I believe you should always leave a talk with some useful, tangible information that you can, put, that you can make use of and improve your life. And, and this is the information to take away from this. This works if your phone is stationary with respect to the automobile, to the, the reference frame of the car. Now, the software is learning that as the car moves and the phone moves, it's learning whether the phone is in your hand or the phone is in, a, in a, one of those dashboard mounted devices or even in the cup holder or even laying on the seat, but kind of stationary with respect to the car. So if you want a better nav experience, do that. Make sure your phone, ideally one of those things on the, on the windshield because then you improve the RF as well. But you'll get the blue instead of the green. Okay, another thing is geofencing. You've all heard of geofencing. It's, it's an abstract extraction of location where you define uh, the way we do is define a, a point and a radius, so it's a circle, and then uh, any app can define up to 100 geofences and then set a wake up so that any time for any of the following, any or all, whether if you enter or exit or if you've dwelled within the geofence for a certain amount of time that the app decides. And so example of this, and there's thousands of examples, uh, one of the canonical ones is remind me to get milk when I drive past Safeways. Right? And as you approach Safeway, go beep, don't forget the milk at Safeway. Right? Another one is, uh, this is a nice one. Uh, uh, for, so this is built into the Android system. So you, you, you know that when you pick up your phone, you have to type in the pin code. And it's irritating if you have to do that the whole time. Well, there's fingerprint sensors, but maybe you don't want to use that. So when you're at home, maybe you don't want your phone to be locked. So when your phone's at home, it can automatically be unlocked. And as soon as the phone moves away from home, then that lock capability comes. That's just one example. Uh, and the, but an interesting thing about this is that geofencing is done on a, on a sensor chip that's a tiny little chip, much smaller than the application processor that, that is on your phone that is more powerful than just about every computer you've owned in your life and is, is very power hungry. Uh, application processor draws one to two amps and the, the little sensor hub chip that this runs on uh, draws milliamps and then plus you only have to check every now and again to make it work so you can, have, you can be checking location all day long and have less than 1% impact on battery life, especially on new phones and especially, of course, on the Pixel is the newest phone of all. Okay, so then I, I, I must mention beacons, another form of location. So a beacon, BLE is Bluetooth low energy. So a beacon is in a way like a physical analog of a geofence. A geofence is kind of an abstraction of something. A beacon, you walk up to a, a Bluetooth beacon and as you get close, your phone can tell that is close. So it's, it's like a geofence, but especially used for close proximity and indoors. So for things like museums, you walk up to a painting, it can tell you about it. And Eddie Stone is, a, is an open standard from Google to, to allow people to build beacons in a way uh, that allows all, all different phones, uh, Android or uh, iOS, to, to interact with that beacon and get a unique number and get a URL and find out if the battery is low if you're managing a whole fleet of beacons. Uh, and then when you talk about beacons, we should talk about ultrasound because Bluetooth is for the beacons, so that's radio. It's kind of, this is a nice slide to have on a Marconi day. So think about BLE, even though it's low energy, you pick it up at about 100, up to about 100 feet away and Murphy's Law says, particularly when you don't want to, you'll, the signal will get ducted. So it's not that secure and it'll go through walls. Uh, ultrasound can be, the, the way it's implemented, which I will show you in the next slide, has a range of only a few feet, so it's inherently very secure, and by design, most walls don't let sound through. So it it's, tends to, the ultrasound tends to live in, in the room. This is actually technically near ultrasound, if you know your audio band, 18 and a half to 20 kilohertz. And a really interesting thing for this audience is that the way we implement this is we have a, a spread spectrum uh, code. Uh, so there's a DSS, uh, it's a maximal length code. Uh, right at the edge of the uh, sound frequency that's supported by the phones. It's a very small amplitude signal, 
but it's direct sequence spreading and that the characteristic of that and the frequency you can see that, that flat response. And so it's very robust, just like GPS. So even in the presence of real sound, uh, you'll, you'll be able to despread that signal and make a range measurement to inch accuracy, uh, but also just to tell that you're close to something. And so why you, you would have that is you want to move to a world where when you, your phone associates with another phone, like your friends, it's only associating with phones nearby. Or when you walk into a room and you connect to a projector in a, some company's room, it only connects, to the, the projector in that room connects to your phone and vice versa and not the one in the room next door. And so there's a lot of security around sound that allow distance to be measured in a secure way that, that where radio is, is really a problem. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a victim of its own success, radio. It goes too far. Okay, okay uh, so I must talk about Tango, which is vision. And so uh, Georg and Paul talked about the importance of vision. And, and Tango is something that Google started a few years ago. And what it is is a, uh, a standard for instead of just having regular cameras on a device, you have a depth sensing camera and a motion tracking camera and vision processing software. So like with all things at Google, what we do is, is make a reference device. So this was an actual tablet you could buy from Google, but it wasn't meant, we weren't getting in the tablet business. We were making a reference design that other people could copy. And Lenovo is the first company to, to implement that in a smartphone. So you can see these different cameras there. And now, and the, these things can track features. And when you track features, you can get trajectories the way we do just by seeing the, the, how you're moving through the space. And I'm going to show you a short movie to demonstrate that. So this is just using the vision, what you'll see now. Creates that trajectory. So it's using the sensors to, to keep the vision, to know where it's pointed, but the, the trajectory is coming just from processing what it's seeing. So you see you're going up the steps, across the building, and down. Now you combine that with locations that I've been talking about, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth beacons and so on, and you can navigate through a building using all of the above. And this is what it looks like. And that's augmented reality, so you can actually get directions as you move around the building. Right, so, you, so what you're seeing on, on the left is what the person's seeing through their eyes, and on the right, what they're seeing on their tablet, and then navigate to some end point. And, and it's my opinion that this is really the key thing, that this is the way and that you will navigate around indoors, because one of the things that we don't often talk about uh, is that the indoor, not only is it harder to do location indoors than outside, like the accuracy is on as good as you've seen from all the speakers, but the requirements are much greater. So turn-by-turn -turn navigation in cars works so well because you only have to be good to about 10 meters. Like you saw in San Francisco, those positions jump around, but the streets are about 20 meters wide. So you only have to be good to about 10, 15 meters for the turn-by-turn -turn nav to work. But indoors, like if you look at this example, you're walking through an office, there might be some point that you could turn every few meters. So for it to tell you, so you cannot adopt the paradigm that we used to, ahead, turn left. You'd be like, what do you mean ahead? There's six different places I could turn left ahead. And, and I, it's my personal belief that this augmented reality approach is really the way to go. It's, it's, it's kind of like the NA that Brad was showing us. Uh, it's, it's not annoying. You just look and see. It's intuitive. Uh, and most importantly, we've all been taught how to obey augmented reality thanks to Pokemon Go, right? <laughs> okay. So now you think we're done, right? I mean, I've talked about everything, including indoor navigation. That must be the end of location. But an interesting thing is that, I, and I didn't really learn of all these years that Pear talked about that I've been doing navigation. I didn't really get that that's not the end until you get, it's kind of like, I don't know, sort of a bit mystical. There's a higher level of, of abstraction than all of this, which is what place are you at? And that's what real humans who are not in this room, but like civilians, want to know, like, where am I? Never mind that long and address and everything. And, and the highest level of abstraction is, is the place, and let me explain that. So you want to tell somebody, meet me here. You're in a restaurant, if you're the kind of person who photographs your food, maybe you want to label, a, you, you want the food to show up, or you just want to send a message, meet me here, right? Well, how do you do that? Well, if, if you, this, this is a live example. So that restaurant is this restaurant right here, Morocco's restaurant, and this is in Mountain View. And the GPS worked, but you're indoors, so it didn't work so great. So the location came out here at the cycle shop. So if you sent them the lat long, first of all, if they weren't in this room, they wouldn't understand it. So what do you do about that? Well, you do reverse geocoding. Yay. 
reverse geocoding puts an address to that long. But it's the wrong address. It's the cycle shot, right? So, so what do you really do? Well, there's this API which you can exercise. So any app that's in Android can do exercise the place detection API. And this, again, will make use of machine learning. So this is another example I want to highlight, although there are many other examples that I'm not highlighting just because I can't. But, uh, but this, this uh, API makes use of machine learning. And it, if you say, tell me where I am, it tells you you're at Morocco's restaurant, just from the data you've just seen. So how, how did it do that? Right? Well, it, it's Google. It knows the opening hours of every single store and restaurant and everything. It knows that this is happening at night. The restaurant is open. The cycle shop is closed. It also knows how popular every place is at certain times. I'm sure you've seen this. You go to a restaurant, it tells you the popularity times. It takes that into account. It also knows the geometry. It's got a GPS location that was wrong, but it got a bubble around it. It got the, the error me uh, metric from the GPS manufacturer. So it knows you're not really in the middle of that thing. You're somewhere here with a certain probability. It knows the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals around it, like I've described. It puts that all into a feature, just the, in an analogous way to what I told you about the sensors. And it comes up with a list of predictions. And if you just ask it, get current place, it gives you the number one on the list, which happens to be right there. Uh, and if you want to experience that, uh, and then if you just said, come to this place, it would tell you Morocco's restaurant. The photograph would be labeled Morocco's restaurant and so on. And if you want to experience for yourself and you're blessed enough to be carrying an Android phone, you just bring up Google Maps. And if you click on the blue dot, I just did that, and it tells me. Here, so then it exercises Google's uh, artificial intelligence, and it told me I'm at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. It wasn't that hard because it was there. But, <laughs> but you can actually see it working. You can see what other choices it made. The Starbucks is just across the street there, by the way. Good hint. Uh, so, and you can actually see, you can see its brain thinking. And so that's a really interesting the thing for me, in a few months at Google, just to realize this, that once we're done getting millimeters or nanometers or nautical miles, we're not really done. And there's this higher level of abstraction that we should keep in mind of what do people really want to know with location. And so uh, that, takes us, that takes us from the center of your phone all the way to the highest level. And uh, that's my story for today. Thank you. Hey, Frank. Hey. Hey, uh, good job. We spent a lot of time in Japan, you'll recall. Why mm -hmm. wasn't that the first country selected for emergency location? I'm just curious, other than the US. Yeah, good question. So why, why wasn't Japan the first country? I, I actually don't know this. It was, it was UK and Estonia were the two first countries. So I don't know what they have in common either. It was just, maybe it was, so I don't know yeah, why yeah. those, it, you know, it, it was, it's, it's, do, it's to do with which carriers are ready to go and, and, and so on. I think it's going to roll out over the, over the whole world. Got it. And there had to be one first. Uh, so. the, maybe the more general question, the one meter, that was a range, right? Yes. Okay, so location kind of needs geometry, right? Yeah. Multiple so, yes. Cells. So the question there, one meter, uh, so the one meter accuracy from RTT is a range. So you're going to have DOP issues. You're going to have multipath, just like outside. And all the fun we have outside, we're going to have inside. But at least we're doing it with speed of light. <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. OK, thanks. Do you do any angle uh, masking? Like so you don't pick up satellites uh, you know, that are too low on the horizon? Uh, OK, so the question, are we doing angle masking? So the location that's coming out of the GPS is coming from the GPS vendors, right? And they, and they have years of experience of that. Uh, and, and so that's who does, who gets the location. In terms of the raw measurements, we provide all the measurements. And so you can, you get all the measurements. There's no masking on what measurements come out. Very nice, Frank. Um, in a lot of security paradigms, being able to prove where you are is extremely important. And one of the ways you can do that is if you can get access to the raw A to D samples, then you can go off and do various techniques to, to establish that that person is really at that location. Do you see uh, being able to get that, you know, when I talk about a snapshot, I'm thinking about something, maybe 100K samples. Do you see an ability to get that out of the Android phone in the near future? Uh, so I think you're, so you're saying is it ability to get like IQ samples? Yeah, raw, raw AD right. samples. So uh, no, there, there's not an ability to do that. That's happening at the, at the chip level. Right. Right, and we're getting the measurements out at typically one hertz. And so we don't see the IQs, and we're providing what we get. 
Uh, now, in, in terms of location security, what's, what's very interesting and what is coming out is the data, the broadcast data, because Galileo has reserved bits for authentication. So there's right. a cryptographically secured signature that they've designed into their system, which they'll begin broadcasting in 2018. Yes. And those bits that I showed you there in decimal format will contain that information. So that'll right. be a But that does not prove location. They've actually got another signal in their CS signal where you can actually prove the location. And I'd like to get access oh. to that. Okay. Well. Anyway. Okay. That, yeah, got <laughs> okay. Hi, Frank. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So how does your uh, raw GPS data, um, the quality of the raw GPS data compare with uh, other commercial GPS receivers such as U-Block receivers? Uh, so to, it, it all depends on the antenna. If, yeah, so the, the chips are very similar. I mean, one thing that, you know, remember Moore's law, right? The chip gets twice as small every two years. It, it doesn't get any worse. It actually gets better because it's, it's less power hungry. So as the chips have got really, really small in the phone, we didn't give up anything that we had from the big chips that we used to make at Ashtec when I was there. We actually got better. So the chips themselves that come from Broadcom, Qualcomm, and so on, can measure carrier phase very, very well. The antennas in phones are very bad. So uh, a U-Box usually comes with a board or a, a patch antenna. So, so that makes a, a huge difference. So you will see bad signals in a phone because of the antenna. And there have been phones in the past that had, had uh, external antenna connectors. The, uh, one of the Samsung phones, the, ante the GPS antenna was actually in the back cover, which you could, which you could peel off so you could replace the battery. And they had an RF connector there. So for no particular GPS reason, they had an RF connector to the antenna. So if somebody wants to make a phone with an RF connector and you can put a decent antenna on it, then I think you'll get very, very good results out of the phone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.